and welcome everyone. Um, this is the Administrative Law and Regulation Practice Group, and um, this is our um, topic on administrative law today, independent agencies, how independent is too independent. I'd like to welcome you all here this afternoon and also welcome those of you who are um, listening in in the overflow rooms and online. Everyone is most welcome. The Supreme Court has lately shown um, a greater interest in the constitutional limits on our independent agencies. Statutory limits on the president's authority to remove agency officials raise uh, questions under the Appointments Clause, the Take Care Clause, and the Doctrine of Separation of Powers. And our panel today will take up this topic under that broad heading of the question, how independent is too independent? As always, the Federalist Society has assembled a panel of all stars for our discussion here today. Distinguished scholars in the fields of administrative and constitutional law who will discuss and debate the law of independent agency accountability and oversight. First up this morning will be John Eastman, professor of law at Chapman University Law School, where he teaches constitutional law and legal history and runs the Constitutional Jurisprudence Clinic. Professor Eastman is also a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute and director of its Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence. He holds a PhD from Claremont and a JD from the University of Chicago Law School. He clerked at the Fourth Circuit for Judge Michael Ludig and at the Supreme Court for Justice Thomas. Next up this afternoon will be Jennifer Mascott, assistant professor of law at George Mason's Antonin Scalia Law School where she teaches administrative law. Professor Mascott graduated summa cum laude from the George Washington University Law School and clerked for then Judge Brett Kavanaugh of the DC Circuit and at the Supreme Court for Justice Thomas. After Professor Mascott presents her opening remarks, we'll hear from Henry Kerner, who serves as special counsel in the office of the special counsel. <laughs> no, it's not what you're thinking about. Uh, Mr. Kerner runs the United States Office of Special Counsel, an independent federal investigative agency whose basic legislative authority is found in four federal statutes, the Civil Service Reform Act, the Whistleblower Protection Act, the Hatch Act, and the Uniformed Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act, or USERA. The agency is charged with safeguarding the integrity of the merit system in federal employment by protecting employees and applicants from prohibited personnel practices, including retaliation for whistleblowing. He'll tell you more about it in his remarks here this afternoon. Mr. Kerner is a graduate of Harvard Law School and spent 18 years as a prosecutor in California before coming to Washington, D.C. to serve in a series of positions on Capitol Hill as an investigator for the House Committee on Oversight and for the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. Rounding out our discussion this afternoon, we'll hear from uh, William Busby, who is professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center, where he teaches administrative law, legislation and regulation, and environmental law. Professor Busby came to Georgetown from Emory Law School, where he had similar academic interests and teaching loads. He earned his law degree at Columbia and clerked on the Second Circuit for Judge Jose Cabranes. With that, I'll turn the podium over to Professor Eastman, who will get us started today. Thank you, Judge Sykes. And before I give my uh, uh, comments about this panel, I'm also the chairman of the Federalism and Separation of Powers Practice Group, so I have duties with that. For anybody interested in uh, being considered for joining the executive committee of that practice group, um, please let me know or Julie Nix or Dean Reuter know. We're always looking for new blog and people to help share the, the work of that uh, important practice group. So for many years, I've thought about um, uh, getting a, you know, one of those Powerball glass bowls and putting letters into it and reaching in and grabbing any five out and seeing who could make the most number of federal agencies out of the random number we have. You'd have to have a C in there for commission and a B in there for board. They all seem to have those, but FEC or SEC or FTC or NLRB or FERC or CFPB, we're very keen on acronyms in this town. Um, 
uh, but it, I think, indicates a kind of a deeper constitutional structure um, problem that we have. How independent is too independent is the, the topic of the panel. My short answer is any independence is too independence, any from constitutional officers. But I think Gene and Leonard would not be happy if I left it there. So let me elaborate a little bit. Um, but we're trying to look at these things after 200 years. Sometimes our ship of state has grown layers and layers and layers of barnacles. And until you start carving those away, it's a little hard um, to see what the real question, the underlying fundamental questions are. So I always like to return to first principles on these things. You know, right there, it's buried deep in the Constitution. Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States. Uh, from that, we get the non-delegation doctrine that's largely been dead since 1935. But uh, 15, 18 years ago, Justice Thomas, in uh, the Whitman versus American Trucking case, invited us to reconsider uh, the intelligibility principle doctrine. He says, even when it's met, it allows delegation of lawmaking power. So, quote, I would be willing to address the question whether our delegation jurisprudence has strayed too far from our founders' understanding of separation of powers. And then, of course, a few years ago, in a series of cases, he really um, uh, made good on that promise to reconsider these things. Um, uh, Department of Transportation versus Association of American Railroads. We never even glance at the Constitution to see what it says about how this authority must be exercised and by whom. And he offered a blunt assessment of the competing visions at stake. Um, he said we should return to the original meaning of the Constitution. The government must create generally applicable rules of private conduct through the legislative branch, not through the executive branch. We have too long abrogated our duty to enforce the separation of powers required by our Constitution, he said. Uh, we've overseen and sanctioned the growth of an administrative state system that concentrates power to make laws and the power to enforce them in the hands of a vast and unaccountable administrative apparatus that finds no comfortable home, I would say not even an uncomfortable home in our constitutional structure. The end result in that case may be trains that run on time, although this wonderful little paraphrase, although I doubt it, <laughs> but the cost is to our constitution and the individual liberty that it protects. Um, uh, you, he's done uh, this a number of times, and he ties this in another case, Perez versus Mortgage Bankers that same year, to kind of an outgrowth of the Woodrow Wilsonian progressive movement, that we're gonna staff up these agencies with experts, um, we're gonna get beyond any political accountability because um, they're more than just um, uh, standing in the way, they create a clumsy nuisance, he quotes uh, Woodrow Wilson, a uh, rusted handling of delicate machinery. We need these experts to kind of figure this stuff out better for us. It really is a dramatic differently, dramatically different understanding of government and the role of, of the, the, the people and the ultimate authority of the people in deciding the course of our government. So, so the notion of independent agencies, this is true even when an executive agency, pure and simple, is getting delegations of lawmaking power. It's even more true with even less accountability when it's in a so-called administrative agency. So piece one of this is the under fundamental violation of the Article I command that the lawmaking power be exercised by Congress. Um, not to be left out, we have that first clause of Article II. Uh, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. Full stop. The entire executive power. Now, the Constitution mentions other executive officers. It mentions heads of departments. It mentions the vice president. It mentions uh, ambassadors and councils and military officers. But all of them exercise their executive power derivative of the president. Um, Jennifer Mascott's wonderful piece, and I commend it to your attention. I'll do this so she doesn't have to. Her, her piece on the definition of officer uh, recently published in the Standard, Stanford Law Review. 
uh, I think pr uh, conclusively demonstrates that we've been much too stingy with that understanding. And why is that important? Well, the broader the understanding of officer, the more accountability there is to the president for the basic ongoing functions of the executive branch. Principal officers and inferior officers cover a lot more ground than we've come to realize. Uh, and because we've too stingily interpreted those requirements, we've left whole aspects of executive authority immune from, or largely immune from, from presidential control. We get these cases coming up and who do you get to fire and how many layers of for cause removal must be there for it to be constitutionally valid. But the fact of the matter is, we give much more protection to independent agencies and officers than the Constitution allows. And we ought to revisit that uh, fairly, fairly quickly. So um, the short answer is, Myers was right, Humphrey's executors was wrong, and Justice Scalia got it right in his dissenting opinion in Morrison versus Olson. And it's time for us, I think, to revisit those. What would be left in such a world? Well, you could have commissions that make legislative recommendations without binding force. Um, you might have commissions that could offer recommendations on the, on the exercise of executive powers, such as when to use the pardon power and when not, uh, or the use of prosecutorial discretion, as long as those also don't have binding force. But if these unelected and unaccountable officers, unappointed by the constitutional process, are making judgments with binding force without the oversight of the president, you've got a real problem under Article Two. it seems to me. Um, I won't get into the details on the cases. The other panelists will go into more uh, detail about the current state of affairs, but you know things like the CFPB and what have you, uh, these are, are front and center on those cases right now. Now, I don't want to leave the judiciary out of that because we also have a problem there. Article 3, Section 1, Clause 1, they put them, I mean, I know they buried them all. There's right, right at the beginning of each section. <laughs> the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. That's a full stop as well. All of the judicial power is specified, that is then enumerated, is vested in the courts. So we now have the agencies, though, that write their own rules from a delegate of lawmaking power. They enforce their own rules without oversight from the duly elected executive. And then they adjudicate the enforcement of their own rules. Um, uh, I'd say that fits a little less comfortably within our constitutional design than the founders had in mind. Um, like, not at all. So, for example, <laughs> The, 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 the case last term of Lucia or Lucia, uh, I've never gotten the pronunciation uh, uh, properly conveyed to me. I don't know which it is, but um, uh, the phase two litigation of that idea ought not to be whether the officers were properly appointed. That's our Article II issue. Um, but, but can we be adjudicating private rights from within an executive or worse, an independent agency uh, completely removed from the judicial power of the United States? I think under our Constitution, the answer to that is easy as well. No, we cannot. Um, after all, it was Madison in Federalist 47 that reminded us that the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hands whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. Of course, he gets that from Montesquieu, and let me just close with, with this wonderful passage from Montesquieu um, that, that should be uh, familiar uh, to many. When the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or in the same body of magistrates, there can be no liberty. Again, there's no liberty if the judiciary power is not separated from the legislative and executive. Were it joined with the legislative, the life and liberty of the subject would be exposed to arbitrary control, for the judge would then be the legislator. Were it joined to the executive power, the judge might behave with violence and oppression. There would be an end to everything. Were the same man or the same body, whether of the nobles or of the people, to exercise those three powers, that of enacting laws, that of executing the public resolutions and of trying the cases of individuals. Our administrative state has violated this principle um, routinely over the last half century. I'm so excited to see the large number of justices on the Supreme Court now 
engaging in revisiting some of those questions and starting to strip away some of the barnacles that have grown up on our ship of state. Thanks so much. I'm Jen Mascott. Thanks, John, for those nice words, and thanks, Judge Sykes, for moderating the panel and the Federalist Society for all the time that it takes to put this convention together every year. I'm really thankful to be here. Um, and I'm going to start similar to how John started with how is independent is too independent for agencies. And as John said, I think really in a certain sense the bottom line answer is that any independence is too much. That doesn't mean the government should neglect impartiality. Our elected leaders and all governmental actors need to serve everyone fairly, fulfill their oaths to the Constitution, and everybody in the executive branch and administrative agencies needs to seek to faithfully execute the law. But independence within our current governmental structure has come to mean independent from the control of the executive and thus from electoral accountability. Independent agencies today are wielding significant power, and we've somehow gotten this idea in our modern system that we want a government staffed by scientific experts who are going to somehow independently do the right thing, irrespective of direction from the politically elected executive. And this is just flat wrong within our constitutional structure. It's clear from the text of the Constitution itself, its structure, founding era documents like the ratification debates, that the federal government derives its power from the consent of the governed. The federal government's supposed to have three branches, just three, no more. And the executive and legislative branch in particular are to gain authority to exercise power by being elected. One reason I belabor this point a little bit is that some contemporary scholars say that maybe now we need a new kind of an updated separation of powers framework, maybe within administrative agencies themselves. And so these scholars acknowledge perhaps administrative agencies might be able to uh, do things more efficiently. And so maybe if we give agencies their own internal soft separation of powers like constraints, that will be adequate to mimic the constitutional structure. So perhaps notice and comment rulemaking can be like the public input required from elections, these scholars say. Maybe the tenure protected civil servant, civil service can act like a nonpartisan mini Article III judiciary. Well, this misunderstands the key point, I think, that James Madison makes about separation of powers in Federalist 51. And that is that the branches get their ability to be able to check each other by being accountable back to the people through elections. Madison wrote, a dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government. And so there cannot be a floating set of key administrative entities that lack accountability back to their elected head. If some of our modern agencies fit anywhere within our constitutional structure, it would naturally be within the executive branch as they're in theory ex executing or carrying out the law. And if that's the case, that means every action that they take needs to be subject to the authority of the executive. Somehow, down to every level of power exercised within the executive branch, there needs to be a line of accountability back up to the president. And so as John mentioned a bit, the accountability of appointments and the ability to be able to remove and supervise officials and personnel within the executive branch are all key for accountability. This is important to preserve the role of self-governance within our system and to preserve individual rights, quite frankly. If our governmental system intrudes on the president's ability to exercise proper authority over the executive branch, then ultimately the people are going to lose some of the say in their governance. Governance. So I think there are at least two areas of law that have recently been before the courts that relate to this issue of independence in administrative agencies, and I think provide a real opportunity for us to reinvigorate discussion about the proper size and scope of agencies overall reevaluate really whether there's any proper role for modern independent agencies within our constitutional structure as they're now designed, and re-examine whether agencies right now are properly being limited to the exercise of executive functions for which they're accountable at least indirectly back to the people through the chief executive. So I think most obviously one line of cases that jumps to mind are the cases dealing with the constitutionality of the structure of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. These cases have been in the news a lot because of the DC Circuit um, hearing the reviewing the constitutionality of the uh, CFPB now on two occasions, opinion finding it unconstitutional for 
first at the panel level by then Judge Kavanaugh. And so this issue of the CFPB and its structure came up a little bit even during the confirmation hearings recently. And the idea basically of the case and of then Judge Kavanaugh's opinion is that as John mentioned, you know, in 1935, the Supreme Court and Humphrey's executor gave what in theory is the constitutional justification for in general independent agencies. Um, very inconsistent with the decision nine years earlier in Myers that gave executive accountability in large measure to the president. But in Humphrey's executor, the court went a different way. And it said, we've got these commissions. They're headed by multiple people at the top, representing both political parties. And so we want these scientific experts at the top over their large substantive uh, policy areas to be governing in a way that's not beholden to the politics of the president. Um, and what Judge Kavanaugh said in his opinion, basically, is that even if you agree with the um, Humphreys executive decision and give stare decisis effect to it, that um, now Congress is structuring agencies in ways that go many steps even beyond the independence and the lack of executive control over commissions in Humphreys executor. And so he pointed out that with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, it's headed by one director who's subject to removal only for a cause. Um, and so instead of even having the accountability of having to work together as a team with folks at the top to govern this entity, this director is able to uh, go on his or her own, uh, not really subject to presidential control, and run this big agency. Because the uh, director has a five-year term, in theory, a president may not even ever have a chance to pick the head of the CFPB on the appointment side in the president's term. The CFPB has a lot of more power even than some other agencies because it's in charge of helping to implement 18 consumer financial protection statutes that previously had been administered by multiple agencies. And then one of the other key things that Judge Kavanaugh pointed out is that the CFPB does not have to report to Congress and get annual appropriations through the congressional process. It can sort of on its own up to a point decide how many funds it needs from uh, funding within the Federal Reserve. And so Judge Kavanaugh said, you know, even if you bind to the Humphreys executor line, this goes quite a bit beyond that, and this is unconstitutional. As you all probably know, the D.C. Circuit sitting on bonk disagreed squarely with, with Judge Kavanaugh. Um, but the PHH regulated entity in the case did not challenge this case and bring it up to the level of the Supreme Court and give them a chance to review it because the DC Circuit at the same time that it found um, the CFPB structure to be fine, it found the penalty that the CFPB imposed to be um, problematic and so PHH never had any incentive to go up to the Supreme Court. But over the summer, um, in a case involving State National Bank of Big Spring, which is being litigated by um, former Ambassador Gray's um, also White House counsel's firm, um, the, D the DC Circuit summarily affirmed its reasoning in the, in the PHH case, again found the CFPB structure to be constitutional, and so now the, the Big Spring Bank has filed a petition before the court. The government's response is not due until December 10th, but perhaps if the court decides to take that case, the constitutionality of the CFPB will be squarely before it. Also this summer, showing how pressing of an issue these new agencies are, in the Fifth Circuit, um, there's arguably been a circuit split created in a case, Collins versus Mnuchin, dealing with the constitutionality of the Federal Housing Finance Agency, which was created in 2008 to oversee Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in light of some of the problems with mortgages. And so similarly to the CFPB, here's another agency that's headed by one person who's subject to four-cause removal protection, so it's not easy for the executive to supervise what's happening within the agency. Another agency that does not have to report to Congress for annual appropriations. And so the Fifth Circuit, in a procurium opinion, found that this structure was unconstitutional. The opinion is written in a way to try to suggest maybe that there's not a circuit split with the PHH decision, because the court pretty clearly says in the Collins case that um, they're not holding that just the removal protections alone are unconstitutional. It's the combination of all these factors that makes it very hard for the executive to supervise the agency at stake. But I think, you know, if the court were to look at this, it's likely that they would find the two decisions to be in conflict. That decision's not being petitioned right now to the Supreme Court because there are pending um, petitions for en banc rehearing within the Fifth Circuit. But there's just case after case, you know, because obviously regulated entities are facing um, lots of consequences, penalties, fines from these agencies, and are, you know, trying to figure out where in the Constitution there's supervision of what's happening. Um, so I think before long these issues will come before the court. 
Also to tie into what John said about Lucia versus SEC, I actually think the Lucia decision is another key way in which the court will have to look at removal protections. As John mentioned, that case found that administrative law judges who preside over formal agency hearings are officers of the United States. So they've got to be appointed by the president with Senate consent, the president alone, a department head, or a court of law. Um, and so I think in reaching that decision, the court very clearly put the um, ALJs under executive accountability on the front end. And the question will be now the court has caused us all to look again at these agency adjudicators um, who are exercising significant authority. That case came up because Mr. Lucia received a $300,000 penalty and was told that he has a lifetime bar on practicing in the securities industry. This is by an administrative uh, official who had not been appointed uh, really by, by any other officer. Um, you know, these are becoming big issues, and I think the court's going to start maybe seeing litigation over the years on the back end. Are ALJ's removal protections too um, tough under Free Enterprise Fund, which suggests that perhaps at some point there are too many layers of removal protections where the president's authority to take care that the law be faithfully executed is restrained too, too sizably. ALJs are subject by statute to removal for a cause as determined by the Merit Systems Protection Board. So these officials who are presiding over um, arguably big issues, touching possibly on private rights, um, to, to remove them if there was misconduct, you'd have to get with an independent agency, the commissioners to find good cause, um, and then that finding would have to be um, approved by layers of people protected by for a cause removal within the Merit Systems Protection Board. So I think litigants, probably will and hopefully will start to challenge on the back end um, as the Solicitor General tried to get the court to take a look at in Lucia whether there's some trouble um, with supervision over agency adjudication as well, which might cause us in general, as John said, to question are adjudicators within agencies just perhaps hearing too many um, issues and cases to begin with. So thanks a lot. I look forward to the Q&A discussion. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, as I was listening to these, presentations, these ex two excellent presentations, I was wondering whether they're talking about me. I was thinking, <laughs> am I just exhibit A of this unaccountable bureaucrat who has way too much power and, and is accountable to no one, and I'm feeling very constitutionally infirm at the moment. <laughs> um, however, as my, my, uh, my prepared remarks will hopefully illustrate, I think there's a very good reason why we have independent agencies. So I'm here to advocate on behalf of some independent agencies. One hint, CFPB, they're over there. <laughs> we are over here. <laughs> so, so first of all, it's really a, a great honor to be here. So I appreciate being here. I've been coming to these Federalist Society um, Lawyers Conventions for many, many years. I was a vice president of law school of the Federalist Society, and I've always been a very proud member. It's also a real honor to be among such such distinguished panelists, so thank you for inviting me. Um, some time ago, I completed a quiz asking me which Supreme Court justice's philosophy was most similar to mine. And I was really pleased when Antonin Scalia's picture popped up on my Facebook page. I didn't know about all those privacy things then, but. Um, so today, however, I'll be advocating a position that the late great justice would likely disagree with and supporting the constitutionality and the importance of for-cause removal protections for some single independent agency heads. Most of us are familiar with the expression, where you stand depends on where you sit, which I recently learned is apparently called Miles's Law, after some bureaucrat in the Truman administration. So it's obviously in my own self-interest as a single head of an independent agency to, to favor for-cause only removal. But I would support this position, at least in our case, even if I wasn't the head of the agency. For OSC to do its job credibly, it needs to truly be independent. So let me begin a little bit, uh, just to give you some background about OSC. I appreciate the judge laying out some of what we do. So our, my job is enshrined in statute. It's at 5 USC section 1211, which establishes the Office of Special Counsel, which shall be headed by the Special Counsel. You will note the definite article before the word special counsel, which are distinguished from that of the other special counsel we hear so much about in the news and with whose investigation I have nothing to do with. <laughs> That's very important for people who call our office. We don't do anything with that, which happens a lot. Um, instead, the special counsel is appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate 
for a fixed term of five years and heads up the United States Office of Special Counsel, a permanent, independent, federal, investigative, and prosecutorial agency whose primary mission is the safeguarding of the merit system and federal employment. It does so by protecting employees and applicants from prohibited personnel practices, also known as PPPs, especially reprisals for whistleblowing. The agency also operates as a secure channel for federal whistleblower disclosures of violations of law, rule, or regulation, gross mismanagement, gross waste of funds, abuse of authority, and substantial and specific danger to public health and safety. In addition, OSC issues advice on the Hatch Act and enforces its restrictions on partisan political activity by government employees. Finally, OSC protects the civilian unemployment and reemployment rights of military service members under the USERA, but once again, only against federal agencies. So in fulfilling its oversight and prosecutorial responsibilities, Congress intended OSC to be independent of any direction or control of the president. Because OSC is charged with oversight of the executive branch and prosecuting wrongdoing, such independence is crucial to fulfilling our mission. The principal mechanisms by which Congress, uh, the principal mechanisms that Congress utilized to ensure that OSC's decisions were unbiased and free of undue influence were to impose a five-year fixed term of office and to restrict the president's power to remove the special counsel to instances of inefficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance in office. The Supreme Court has recognized Congress's power to enact statutes that restrict the president's removal power in ways that are compatible with the president's constitutional duty to faithfully execute the laws. In Morrison v. Olson, the court ruled that Congress may impose four cause removal restrictions up until they are of such nature that they impede the president's ability to perform his constitutional duty. As we have learned from our, uh, the presentations prior to this, however, some jurists and academics have criticized the independent single-head agency structure as unconstitutional. In its dissent to the DC Circuit's en banc decision in PHH Corp versus CFPB, now Justice Kavanaugh argued that concentrating power in a single director, as is the structure at the CFPB and also ours, creates a greater risk of arbitrary decision-making, abuses of power, and threats to liberty. To Kavanaugh, the overarching constitutional concern with independent agencies like the CFPB is that they exercise executive power but are unchecked by the president, who's the only official imbued with the executive power by Article II and directly accountable to the people. Some commentators argue that the CFPB's constitutional woes could be cured by transforming the agency into a bipartisan multi-member body, like the Federal Trade Commission. But because the president alone has the power to choose from that point, Bipartisanship requirements are arguably on even shakier constitutional grounds than for cause removal. A bipartisanship requirement forces the president to appoint agency leaders from the opposing politi political party who may not be his preferred candidates and may not be in line with his policy directives. By contrast, allowing the president to remove an independent agency head for inefficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance at least preserves the president's ability to ensure that the laws are faithfully executed. Of these three grounds, inefficiency may be the broadest, as Judge Griffith in his concurrence in PHH articulated. He went further to say that it wouldn't take much for a president to dismiss a recalcitrant agency head as being ineffectual, so long as the president didn't specify that, was, that it was because of a policy disagreement, like in a careless tweet, for example, <laughs> or something. Of course, there could be some costs to that associated with that removal, such as congressional hearings, or a negative headline in the press, President Fires Special Counsel. <laughs> At least I hope that would be a disincentive. Of course, if he so chooses, the president can always fire the agency head anyway and remove him from office. A likely lawsuit, even if it were to get past Justice Ka Kavanaugh, would many years later at most result in back pay as the remedy for the wrongly fired head. So in any event, the president can shed himself of an independent head. As I said from the outset, I support the structure of a single agency head with four cause removal protections for independent agencies that have oversight responsibilities with limited power over private citizens. The calculus is quite different when it comes to more intrusive and powerful agencies like a CFPB. It might therefore be instructive to illustrate the critical differences between OSC and the CFPB. First, OSC is different from CFPB in that OSC cannot act alone to enforce any of our statutes. At OSC, we are wholly dependent on the Merit Systems Protection Board, MSPB, to adjudicate our complaints and to issue orders. 
we seek any corrective or disciplinary actions, we must either try to settle the case or file a complaint with the MSPB. And the MSPB is always free to reject our reasoning and rule against us. Unlike CFPB, OSC is by no means judge, jury, and executioner. We do not have quasi-legislative or judicial powers. Second, OSC's independence is at the heart of OSC's mission. OSC is charged with policing executive branch employees. For example, OSC has exclusive jurisdiction to enforce the Hatch Act, a law that prohibits all federal employees, with the exception of the president and the vice president, from using their job or taxpayer dollars for partisan political purposes. If an administration can fire the special counsel at will for investigating these lawful activities, then the Hatch Act is rendered toothless. A third important distinction between CFPB and OSC is that OSC's sole focus is on wrongdoing within the federal government. We have no authority over private citizens or corporations. We cannot bring enforcement actions against the public, and we cannot issue law-like regulations. Even our Hatch Act regulations reside within the, o the Office of Personnel Management. This narrow focus on government misconduct underscores the need for OSC's independence. OSC's mission would be compromised if the special counsel were subject to at-will removal. And unlike CFPB, the statutes we enforce have very limited impact on the U.S. economy. Fourth, unlike CFPB or the Fair Housing Finance Agency, a single director-led agency whose structure was recently found unconstitutional by the Fifth Circuit, OSC is not completely unmoored from the executive and legislative branches. The MSPB is made up of presidentially appointed members with staggered term limits. We at OSC also rely on budgetary appropriations from Congress and even submit our annual budget justification to OMB for review. With our purse strings held by Congress and the commissioners of our adjudicatory board appointed by the executive, OSC is only independent in that the special counsel enjoys some protection from at-will termination by the president, a small but necessary protection that allows OSC to fulfill its mission. Independence allows me to stand firm when making what could be politically unpopular decisions. Finally, restructuring OSC to be run by a bipartisan multi-member board, as has been suggested for a CFPB, is incompatible with OSC's mission and function as a prosecutor. As I've said a few times by now, OSC's main authority is to investigate cases of prohibited personnel practices and Hatch Act violations and try those cases before the MSPB. In my first year as special counsel, I've seen how decisions need to be made quickly and efficiently. In the past, our process has been rightly criticized as at times being too slow. Once a case is finally ready to be closed or a complaint for corrective action filed, having multiple principles at OSC would be inefficient and burdensome. Just like the structure of the executive branch, having a single independent principle at OSC facilitates faster decision making while also maintaining built-in checks and balances. The bottom line is that not all independent agencies are alike. OSC's mission is uniquely nonpartisan and the special counsel needs to be free from political pressure exerted by the executive branch. Having a single agency head who can only be removed for cause is a protection vital to OSC's ability to uphold the law and fulfill its mission. Thank you very much. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, nothing like being the last speaker after everyone's eaten lunch. So hope everyone's having a, having a good nap now. Um, <laughs> So, uh, well, first, I guess I look at my name and it says William Busby Federal Society, and I suddenly wonder what's happened. And I just, just to be clear, I think I was asked to be here as a sort of counterpoint, uh, and I don't agree with much of what I've heard, but let me um, reason my way to my conclusions, suggest that there are some important parts of the Constitution and our laws development that are being neglected in some of these discussions, and suggest why the view that almost any agency is constitutionally problematic is itself constitutionally problematic and unfaithful to the bargain we see in the Constitution. Um, and um, I guess I'd start off by saying I think um, uh, Special Counsel Kerner's points here are really a perfect example, right? So at one point, I think everyone has concerns with lack of accountability. But then when you start looking at each agency and try to understand what they do, you can see why radical justices like Justice Scalia were very concerned with making sure agencies abide by their statutory, substantive criteria and procedural criteria, uh, which is about much more than just a president's power to appoint or remove. So, um, and I would say that the discussion of CFPB and the free enterprise case in Lucia 
um, are really important here today, not so much just for those cases, which mostly can be uh, formally worked around without radical disruption of the federal government, but the, ne the next steps, the way in which they are a sort of toehold for reversals of longstanding uh, administrative law and constitutional law. You know, I think um, starting right off, just as far as kind of historical understandings which are an underpinning of the first two speakers, um, I just commend to you two really great pieces of work. So Jerry Mashaw's book, Creating the Administrative Constitution, The Lost 100 Years of American Administrative Law, is a really important counterpoint to this idea that the world of our country is just courts, uh, legislatures, and presidents. Um, in fact, pointing out that variants of the administrative state emerged immediately in the post-founding era. And he has a wonderful chapter, if you've never read it, on steamboat regulation, a very f early form of health and safety regulation uh, that was enacted when some of the founders were, they were probably getting quite long in the tooth, but they were, uh, some of them would have still been around at that point. Um, the other is, um, I, I know some of you, I know uh, Professor Mascot's familiar with the work of John McKyle, a colleague of mine at Georgetown. And I know that there's a lot of reliance on the Federalist Papers as people talk through these issues. And he's done some really fascinating work on the Federalist Papers themselves and their reliability. And it's in several of his pieces, including a uh, very good article on the Necessary and Proper Clause. But what's interesting is he's pointed out when you start looking at the Federalist Papers, they were, as we all know, they were advocacy pieces written for different states' debates over the Constitution at different points in time. And what he found is they are often actually inaccurate in describing the Constitution as it stood at that point. That is, they were themselves strategic statements and documents. So themselves, when we look at the Federalist Papers or turn to Montesquieu, we have to be wary of that problem, Justice Scalia liked to quote, we should always be wary of any approaches to law where we're just looking over the crowd and picking out our friends. Okay, so let's look at the Constitution here. Um, first, we have to be careful about adding in the word only in connection with key clauses. But more importantly, uh, people quickly move to say the president is critical to accountability, and the president is critical to accountability, but there's no way in which you can look at the Constitution as saying it is the exclusive source of accountability. Most important, of course, is the legislative power, which people did mention. That was good, I was glad. Um, but legislative supremacy has, going back to the earliest Supreme Court decisions, been viewed as the core principle of under our Constitution. That is, when it comes to making policies and handing authority out and requiring action, legislative supremacy is the, really the, uh, the critical source of legitimacy and accountability in our government. And for reasons I'll talk about, that ties in with longstanding views about the administrative state and reasons it should be subject to law and constraint in addition to oversight by the president. So moving on, of course, there is this provision which is also talked past the necessary and proper clause. Uh, you have to think about the fact the Constitution conferred Congress with broad power in making laws to structure the government that resulted. Uh, and if you look at the earliest cases that have sort of worked through uh, the development of the administrative state and the permissible bounds of the administrative state, some of the earliest decisions point that out. Congress chooses to make policy and how to structure how the government works. That is the fundamentals of the necessary and proper clause. Um, and along those lines, for those of you who are eager to go back and read these key Supreme Court decisions, in the Free Enterprise case, Justice Breyer's dissent he has a whole first section where he's not taking on the decision, but where he reviews the law as it stands and as it still stands since no cases were overruled in free enterprise. And he goes through really the, um, the many forms of agencies over time, their structures, the forms of check that are on the agencies, the ways they're appointed, the functions they fulfill. Um, and it's just an important, and he cites the cases by the Supreme Court that still stand that have upheld these many different forms of agencies. So, and that ties in again with legislative supremacy and the necessary and the proper clause, necessary and proper clause. And then, uh, very importantly, the president has an obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Okay, now one approach to that is that it's the president and the president alone decides what that means. That's pretty antithetical to the development of administrative law going back to Marbury versus Madison. 
right? And so there is a role of the courts in overseeing the functions of government, the work of the governments, the appointments, and the faithful uh, carrying out of functions handed out by the legislature, and that is very critical to the president's obligation that the laws be faithfully executed. And when you look at the dozens, probably actually hundreds of cases that have upheld the very basics of the modern administrative state, uh, that is also a critical element here. That we are, you know, our uh, system under the Constitution and under still standing law, we do not have a president who is a freestanding, uh, I guess, uncheckable king or queen, but uh, instead it is a, a, an actor subject to law and who must act in conformity with the law. You know, this is, in fact, the fundamental virtue of modern administrative law. And I think actually that if, well, I won't spend a long time quoting the many cases, but probably the strongest voice in favor of this idea that the administrative state needs to be judicially checked and needs to be subject to law, both in its substantive criteria and its procedures, uh, were dozens of cases by Justice Scalia, okay, where he emphasized this. The problem, of course, is if you start saying that every uh, member of every agency is subject to unfettered, uncheckable removal, then you weaken all of those systems, that every substantive criteria and every procedural choice becomes subject to intimidation or concerns. Uh, I think Special Counsel Kerners uh, mentions here of his role. If his role were subject to unfettered removal by the president at any point, it would be a completely different agency and it would really be unable to fulfill its functions. Moving on, I guess another really important point here is I think um, there is a practical point, which is if agencies are viewed as fundamentally antithetical to the administrative state, and we go, I guess, as uh, Professor Mascot suggested, to something where there could be commissions that make recommendations, then you start having just huge amounts of power being wielded, I, I suppose, by, I wasn't clear who the commission would be making recommendations to, whether it be to... Oh, okay, sorry, John, sorry, John. Professor Eastman. Whether it would be to Congress or to the President, but then the question is, so then you have essentially fleshing out of instructions by either Congress or uh, perhaps the White House, but then judges who are generalists and talented generalists, of course, but judges tend not to know the particulars of the fields in which regulation works. And so it would require a very heroic conception of judicial knowledge and especially expertise in often very technical areas if you started just having commissions making recommendations and then the details being worked out in front of Article III judges. So um, in my sense here, and I gave some comments at the uh, recent law professors uh, convention here a few weeks ago, I think it's really helpful to look at these questions of administrative law structure uh, through a kind of bad man perspective. You're probably familiar, remember, Justice Holmes and his view that you need to look at the law from the perspective of the bad man. That is, someone who would be inclined not to abide by it, and then the question is, is it structured well when a person or people you don't think highly of wield that power? And I think when you look at administrative law and its many, many choices, and Congress's many choices about regulation of the administrative state, what we have is fundamentally an extensive web of constraints to constrain the bad regulator, the bad president, the bad or, or ignorant judge. And so what do we have? So the Administrative Procedure Act, one of the most enduring bodies of law going back to the mid-1940s, which was a compromise really intended to protect business from unfettered and unchecked arbitrary power of agencies. Okay? The APA itself is the underpinning of many of the sources of concern we're talking about today. Similarly, concerns about partisanship and concerns about political favoritism and corruption, uh, especially in regulated indus industries, led to the creation of the independent agencies. Again, a desire to remove decisions from partisanship, corruption, uh, and perhaps other venal motive. Procedural rigor. Statutes, dozens of them, they're wonderful to teach to students because the procedural intricacies of the modern administrative state before different agencies show really quite nuanced and different understandings of the best way to attack challenging social ills. But all of those procedural mandates, again, are very specific to different agencies and tasks. If they all become essentially secondary to presidential whim, 
uh, everyone should be concerned. Um, you know, the partial for protection from politics is one of the points I was going to make. Uh, Special Counsel Kerner, I think, made the point, well, for cause protection is not complete protection from removal. That is, if it were the case, no one would ever be fired in much of the world where for cause protection is the norm uh, in private employment. What it is, it is partial protection. It is essentially protection if you're doing your job. It is protection from dismissal for wrongful reasons. And so that is an important partial for protection from politics and raw use of power. Um, in addition, independent agencies, especially those agencies that are structured to have bipartisan members, they also are an effort to create some insulation from partisan politics and rancor. Um, I won't go into depth here. You're all lawyers, or I guess, is everyone lawyers? Almost everyone here is a lawyer. Um, it doesn't get better. Um, <laughs> so uh, so the, the abundant law about reasoned decision making, okay? is really something that everyone should celebrate, okay? And this whole body of law going back to State Farm, including also cases that have allowed shifts to say market-based permits and the like, um, the whole idea that agencies are held to an obligation to engage in reasoned decision-making, where they engage with facts, they engage with criticism, they engage with the statutes, they use the procedures required by law, this whole body of law really hinges on courts enforcing structures set up by Congress, which again, involve presidential oversight of certain forms, but not unfettered power of the president to remove uh, uh, based on whatever factors the president chooses. Consistency doctrine also I'll point out, again, the key precedents here were both the State Farm case and the Fox, FCC versus Fox, written by, with the main opinion of those partially a splintered court, by Justice Scalia, and then uh, the 2016 opinion by Anthony Kennedy in Encino Motor Cars, that case, those cases collectively say agencies can change policy, but they have to engage with facts, they have to engage with science, they have to offer good reasons for change, and they cannot leave unexplained inconsistency. Again, a fundamental rule of law vir virtue, which requires respect for the rule of law. Um, the basic idea that regulations are, are standing and binding until validly changed is a very important tenet, which also disappears if removal is again at the whim of a president. I should stop there. I guess I would, um, you know, my, my sense here is, I, whenever I think through administrative law, I th I've worked in a public interest environmental group and I represented industry for years in New York City. You know, and I always think back to what most of my business clients wanted, and they were some of the most sophisticated businesses in the country. What they always wanted was, they wanted stability, they wanted known law, they didn't want to have a law where they could not find out what it was. So things like agencies, they always wanted to know what the guidance document said. They wanted to narrow the range of uncertainty. They wanted some stability. They were always concerned with uh, regulators that had unfettered power and could act in unpredictable sorts of ways. So my sense here is that before moving too fast, we have to remember there is a really vast body of law that is about the regulatory rule of law, and it's worth celebrating. Um, and that body of law itself is, has a virtue I just want to close with, which is a, administrative law is a body of constitutional common law. It is a body of law that has built up for several centuries now, and it is pragmatic, sequentially developed, fact-bound, looking at particular statutes, thinking about how they work, um, and it is, in that sense, it is a bipartisan, sequentially developed and handed off body of law. It has a lot of wisdom in it, and it's filled with compromises. And I think we should all be wary of uh, theories or approaches that allow sort of leapfrogging backwards in time past these compromises and pragmatic solutions that have been worked out. So, thank you. All right, if you would um, all start um, thinking about what questions you'd like to ask the panel, I'd like to um, just, um, by way of summarizing the positions that you've just heard, we have um, uh, one group of panelists uh, that have argued that um, independent agencies are essentially unconstitutional all the way down <laughs> uh, under the uh, Constitution's uh, 
um, explication of the executive power, the legislative power, and the judicial power. And on the other end, we have um, the position that um, independent agencies are, um, are meaningfully constrained and that the congressional choice to um, insulate them from um, direct accountability is justified by the need to uh, keep them uh, free to bring their expertise to bear on difficult and complex social and economic problems, uh, free from partisan influence. And then we have sort of a middle ground being occupied by um, Henry Kerner, uh, who has taken the position that regardless of the relative merits of uh, uh, both of those uh, more um, polar opposite positions that his agency, the Office of the Special Counsel, has only limited independence protections and is therefore sort of the Goldilocks of independent agencies <laughs> with just the right amount of independence protections in kind and degree, if I could, by way of summary. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, now, while you're thinking about your questions, and I don't think we have a standing mic, I think we're gonna have a handheld mic for questions, um, but before we get to that, let me uh, pose a question to the panel, um, which is um, particularly from my perspective as, as a judge watching what the Supreme Court um, has recently done and maybe about to do. Um, as I, I look over the uh, Supreme Court's recent re-entry into this field in the Free Enterprise Fund case and the Lucia case or Lucia case, um, I am struck by a distinct uh, impulse of minimalism, um, perhaps, probably, springing from the concern about consequences uh, of um, a shakeup of our modern administrative state that would involve anything more than incremental approaches to these problems as they arise and find their way to the Supreme Court. That's especially evident, I think, in Justice Kagan's decision in the Lucia case, which was very narrow, um, and uh, to a lesser degree in the Chief's decision in the Free Enterprise Fund case. Uh, and with that in mind, I'd like you to address, um, both sides to address um, that reality and whether um, it's likely to continue um, or whether we'll see some more um, rapid acceleration in the court's willingness to address these issues um, at a, a deeply theoretical space. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start. I, you know, I, I think you saw this um, in the peekaboo case initially, right? Okay, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna set down a constitutional marker here, but we're gonna cure the problem to, you know, to stop the hemorrhaging on the consequences while we work through this revisiting of some of the core doctrines. And so I, I think you're right. I, and I, I think this is particularly true of Chief Justice Roberts to a lesser degree of Justice Alito, um, this kind of incrementalism to revisit some of these questions, not quite as so bold and all at once as Justice Thomas has, has become famous for. But remember, he's laying down markers to force people to reconsider things. So I'm not sure he would disagree with that more incremental approach as well. Um, uh, but I, but I, I do think there's some problem, um, uh, and, I, and I, I share Professor Busby's um, notion that there are other me mechanisms of accountability as well. Statutes can do that. But the problem is the statutes aren't being complied with, and part of that is some of the deference doctrines that arose to defer some of the fundamental questions that those statutes are supposed to have settled uh, to the very agency that they are supposed to be making accountable. And Justice Scalia points this out in the Perez case. You know, we've got the APA, um, and it says the courts are supposed to be the ones that give the interpretive answer to an ambiguous statute. And yet we've got doctrines, Chevron deference, that in fact do the opposite. And so the various doctrines in conjunction have uh, magnified the separation of powers problems. And I'm not sure um, you know, adding more statutes is gonna solve that, maybe giving teeth to the statutes we have and faithfully um, employing them but that's not going to get to the incremental piece that you want. It, that, that's, that's almost an all or nothing black and white rule, and it could have some pretty severe consequences. 
I, I do agree that I think the court's likely to continue in a minimalist approach, as, as John said. And I mean, I think that's one reason why um, then Judge Kavanaugh probably wrote his opinion in PHH the way that he did, is that he's trying to um, frame the issue so that there doesn't have to be any overruling or overcoming of precedent like Morrison versus Olson or Humphrey's executor, looking for these places where there's sort of an innovative new structure that seems to take things one step too far, and maybe hoping uh, when he was a judge on the DC Circuit that the court, if it ever got the case, would do something similar to what it did in free enterprise fund, which is say we've got all this precedent on the books. We're keeping that in place, but we're just not going to extend it. In the Lucia decision with the administrative law judges, I mean, the court definitely had a very fact-bound limited decision. It didn't even want to decide things like on remand, does there have to be a totally new adjudicator in place? Maybe in that particular case it did. The court wasn't going to require that moving forward. It wrote its opinion narrowly to really just talk about the SEC ALJs. And so I think it's going to be to the lower courts and the agencies to realize, OK, analogously, what are all the positions that come under Lucia. I mean, on the removal side, I do think that's a place where litigation's going to head. But even there, I mean, the Solicitor General actually did not ask the court to um, strip the ALJ tenure protections. The SG said, um, could the court read them narrowly so that ALJs could be removed for misconduct, failure to follow lawful agency directives, or failure to perform adequately? And the SG was very careful to say this would it would not be appropriate to have a situation where you're just sort of willy-nilly um, removing an ALJ or threatening removal based on how one particular case is going to come out. I mean, I think there's some language to that effect even in the Myers Supreme Court opinion from 1926 that in faithfully executing the laws, we're not talking about you know this kind of idea of threatening people if they're not going to do a politically charged thing of being fired. We're talking about um, you know everybody remaining faithful to their constitutional duties, but to the extent that people are not following the agenda set by Congress, the executive, um, and doing their job, that there does need to be some way to be able to bring supervision and removal. The other piece the SG asked the court to revisit is the MSPB's role and narrow it to just determining that there's a factual basis for the removal rather than a multiple level of um, an appeal structure. Whereas I think now, you know, you, you get your case uh, heard first by an administrative judge within the MSPB, and then it would go up to the board. So I think that could be an incremental way in which um, you know, litigants who are being um, strategic will bring these carefully framed minimalist fact-bound questions to the court and enable the court to sort of reach a decision that's maybe um, right in its view of the Constitution but doesn't necessarily have, um, you know, 100 immediate implications down the line. Professor Busby, any response? One, I, I agree. I think that you see in these cases, especially in Lucia, a very minimalist approach. Free enterprise has, has some much broader language within it, but in the end, what it actually, the court actually does is limited in its scope and carefully says it's not doing something. So I think you see it. So there's one way to look at it is that's just how they got to the majorities in those cases. That is limiting, limiting the reach of them, leaving some questions undecided is just strategic. So it doesn't tell you next. It's a question of where the votes stand. And I think there is some truth to that. But the other is kind of, just a, uh, I think, an interesting big question we'll see. Um, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kagan analytically approach statutory interpretation in very similar ways. They are both um, very thorough readers of statutes in their entirety, in their functioning, putting the provisions together. And I think for this reason, I, I think Chief Justice Roberts, uh, who's a key vote here, I think he understands that different choices and statutes matter and should matter. And I think he would be concerned with too readily jettisoning a body of law or embracing an approach which makes all statutes just about arbitrary power. You know, you look back at his DC Circuit decisions, he is genuinely concerned about arbitrary wielding of power. And if you allow agencies to be subject to threats, uh, reprisals, or dismissals, or the same thing at other officials subject to that, then there's uh, concerns of that. So I think you have the issue of the administrative state, you have the maybe the minimalist approach to create majorities, but maybe also just a respect for and an understanding of the rich choices Congress makes over time in structuring statutes and a desire not to create overly broad rules. The other just court watchers, my friends who are much more uh, day in and day out watchers of the court, I think people view Chief Justice Roberts, who again is a key vote here, as truly being an institutionalist, very concerned about the Supreme Court's integrity. And so part of his reason for embracing more minimal approaches is a radical upheaval and jettisoning of whole bodies of law would be inconsistent with, I think, his view 
of what the court needs to be respected as a legitimate institution. I know this isn't a panel on agency deference, but um, Professor Eastman um, brought this up um, about uh, the likelihood that the court may um, more readily embrace a revisitation of agency deference doctrine uh, as more within the, the comfort zone than some of these more um, radically consequential structural constitutional decisions. Um, and I'd like to hear the other panelists' responses to that. Um, that idea and also whether that's more comfortably within um, the court's vision of its own role as a, an institution that has Republican legitimacy. Wants to go first. I raise it. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, it exacerbates the, I mean, it, you've got both an Article I problem and an Article Three problem. Uh, I think Justice Thomas's opinion, uh, Michigan versus EP, I forget which one, points out the Article Three problem with these deference doctrines. The agencies are themselves interpreting statutes. That's the role of the courts. And it's not just him. I mean, there's uh, um, Bill Eskridge and Cass Sunstein both criticize Chevron deference on those grounds. Um, but but, you, you, but what, what, it exacerbates the consolidation of power problem and the lack of accountability problem. You've got the non-delegation on the front end that allows them to make laws um, you've got the lack of direct supervision from the elected executive that allows them to force laws, maybe contrary to the policy of the administration. And then you've got the deference doctrines that allow them to interpret the laws while they are also adjudicating them. This, this seems to me just a, a huge problem from separation of powers perspectives. And that's with, with a, an, an executive agency, quite apart from an independent agency. Anybody else? I had one thought, sure. um, if I may. So I know Professor Busby was talking about rules and how folks don't like vague rules. So one of the things that's really important in our world is we try to have as clear rules as we can. So we get very clear rules and we try to work on, for example, in the Hatch Act area. We have, we, we, there's, there's regulations promulgated by OPM, but within these, especially with social media and other new developments, how do you get a law from 1939 to apply to Twitter? Right, And so you come up with these, and to go back to what Dean Eastman said, you, at, at some point when you work out with, with practitioners who've been in this field for 20 years, I think they, they have an expertise that ought to be given some credence, right? Because they've been working on this, they've thought this through, they work very hard on this, and when you come up with rules that are clear, then you have robust training, and then you have accountability, you set up sort of a three-legged stool that I think really works. And when you go, when that gets into the courts, and you know, judges at that point are then second guessing these rules or giving you no deference on them. How can, how can judges have that kind of expertise when you've worked on these? So I do think that there's a, a need for, I mean, you know, for te technicians essentially and experts to work through difficult prog problems. And obviously if they run, you know, a violative of statutes or, or the constitution, that's one thing, but, but at least giving them some deference and to appreciate the technical expertise. All right, let's go, oh, you have a response. Sure, absolutely. Um, so um, a couple things. One is there's a kind of Chevron as a kind of, I don't know, toehold or a claim generally about excessive agency power. And then there's Chevron, the actual case, what it says as it currently stands. And so I think there are kind of two issues and people sometimes shift from Chevron as sort of a a placeholder for the problem of the administrative state and then Chevron as it actually stands today. And so, so most importantly is Chevron itself has been subject to substantial limitations. The Mead case comes in. It's, there's kind of a Swiss cheese aspect to Chevron where uh, very little is left of Chevron as more broadly parodied or caricatured when people say it creates kind of un, unfettered power. What Chev where Chevron stands now is effectively rewarding agencies that use notice and comment rulemaking and who in the end come up with a promulgated rule through a transparent and open process subject to judicial review that is reasoned and responds to all salient criticisms. That's what, and if an agency doesn't do that on any of those fronts, you're not in the world of Chevron step two deference. And so I think it's important to remember that Chevron is, is not a, um, you know, permission to agencies to do whatever they want. 
it is in fact a, a regime which is built on the idea that Congress does hand authority to agencies uh, and agencies then with their expertise about the field, the law, related statutes, they come up with regulations. And again, my sense is what business clients especially, which I think is a traditional concern of the federal society, what they want to do is they don't want to have a statute where everyone's guessing how it should be read. In general, people want greater clarity and notice and comment rulemaking is a source of such clarity and also legal stability. So I think it needs to be kind of read for what it actually says. Um, also, just along those lines, there's a, a wonderful famous article, for those of you who really want to get some good reading today, right before the Chevron case came out, Henry Monahan, who's a professor at Columbia, wrote an article called Marbury in the Administrative State. And he basically thought about the nature of authority conferred on agencies and explained why some degree of deference to agencies is basically a constitutional necessity and logically unavoidable and kind of worked his way through it. And although the Chevron case did not cite to that article, it really anticipated the logic of Chevron. And I think it still is for people who try to understand Chevron. It's kind of the, the probably the best article about Chevron, although it was published before it. So, All right, Professor Mascott. What um, Bill just said about um, sorry, <laughs> yelling about st stability. I mean, I, I do see your point about stability, notice and comment rulemaking. I mean, I think ultimately the most stability, of course, would come from clear laws being passed passed by Congress. I mean, the virtue that we'd have if more detail was in congressional legislation as well is, you know, we've got 435 members, 100 senators, they're representing interests geographically all over uh, the country. And so it's just able to represent the interests of the people in a way that um, any agency, whether it's headed by a commission or one person, is just not going to be able to do in as, in as much of a way. So I think a lot of the problems that we're seeing here in talking about whether people are concerned about the whims of executive uh, branch actors or, or whatever it might be could be solved by Congress taking a larger role. Bill also earlier talked about the necessary and proper clause and saying um, with the congressional role and the executive role, I think the suggestion is that if the two politically elected branches reach a compromise under the necessary and proper clause, the idea is we should sort of defer to that and so not be too quick to have courts or ad law scholars or whoever else step in and say, well, that's an unconstitutional arrangement that violates the take care clause or the appointments clause or whatever. I think the, the, the one thing to keep in mind though with that is, you know, if we see the constitution as being the um, document that brings into being this federal government, and we've still got states who are supposed to be operating in the background, if we too much defer to the necessary and proper clause and say that Congress and the executive can do anything they want, even if it's outside of the text of, of constitutional restraints, such as the Commerce Clause, then Congress and the executive might be happy with the arrangement, but I think people, the states, there are others whose interests also need to be looked out for. So obviously we don't want to be willy-nilly, you know, second-guessing the um, elected branches, but the Constitution does have constraints, one of which fundamentally, of course, is the Commerce Clause and limiting federal power just in general. Um, and so I think we need to have comfort where the Constitution does speak clearly to things, coming in and saying that is a, um, that is a limitation that needs to be um, you know, abided by and adhered to, um, even if sometimes it means we're saying that various governmental actors have gone outside of those constraints. All right, thank you. Let's go to your questions. Um, yes, sir. Uh, you want to use the mic? If we have one. Um, oh, it's right over here. There is a standing mic right under the light, so it's hard for me to see it. There we go. And if, you, uh, uh, if others have questions, you can line up next to the, standing, the microphone stand. Thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, Randy May from the Free State Foundation. Uh, Judge Sykes was inching up to the uh, question and point I want to make, and then Professor Eastman came even closer in inching up. But here's, here's the point, uh, and I think the answer to the incrementalist uh, question. Uh, it, why uh, can't the judicial branch, why doesn't or can't the judicial branch uh, impose a less deferential standard in reviewing the action of the truly independent agencies. I'm talking about the FCC and so forth. I, I've written a couple law review articles suggesting that, published in the Administrative Law Review, but more importantly, in Justice Kagan's Presidential Administration article, you know, that mammoth article, it, it is in footnotes, but she uh, basically says that the independent agencies, because they're less accountable 
than the true executive branch agencies because of the lack of uh, the termination uh, ability under the four calls clause, that they should receive less deference from judges like Judge Sykes and others uh, because of that last lack of accountability and because Chevron, which uh, Professor Busby just talked about, is really based at the core of it on the notion of political accountability. I know there's a nod to agency expertise, but political accountability. So maybe uh, Professor Eastman or uh, anyone else could, could uh, talk about whether you think that that might be an incremental step towards holding the independent agencies more accountable? That, that's a really good question. Um, distinguishing between truly independent agencies and other executive agencies for purposes of deference. Yeah, at least as a first step. I'm willing to take a cut back on deference wherever I can get it. So I, you know, uh, I'll, yeah, no, I, I think that's a very good step. And it, it also, I, I, I think, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear from Vesper Busby on this, the notion that the statutes themselves provide some level of accountability if we properly enforce them in the judiciary, I think he would, would share that view. I, <laughs> I mean, you know, the Supreme Court has been confronted with this question. They've declined to uh, approach deference differently for independent agencies and executive agencies. Um, and, well, it's, I, would, I guess I would say it's, it's been mentioned, it's in the opinions, has there been a clear majority that said in recent cases that there, um, that there should be no difference? But, I think kind of for the same reasons that uh, Justice Scalia's opinion in the Arlington FCC case when he said, you know, the difference between a standard question of interpretation and regulation and a jurisdictional question is a hard line to draw. Agencies come in many forms. So if you, there are kind of degrees of independence and degrees of executiveness uh, in agencies. And my sense is this would be kind of unworkable and could become itself very political. So I, I think it would be a bad idea. I still think agencies should be scrutinized closely. I think agencies that don't follow the law, that don't offer good reasoning and, uh, and basis for their decisions should be quickly rejected by the courts. I just don't think the deference regime should change. Anybody else at this point? All right, next question. Yes, uh, Paul Kaminar, a DC lawyer. Just a quick comment and a question uh, with respect to the four cause removal. That issue is before the DC circuit regarding the other special counsel. Uh, Mueller, that's a case I argued last week before the D.C. Circuit, and whether that uh, four-cause removal under the DOJ regulations can be immediately revoked and thereby revert Mueller to an inferior officer. And I cited Jen's article in the case that if he is an inferior officer, he has to be appointed by the head of the department, which was Jeff Sessions. But my question is with respect to the CFPB case. Uh, what, uh, anybody on the panel, uh, what would be the minimalist a solution or answer to that to reverse the DC Circuit case, uh, and how do you do a head count on that, knowing that Justice Kavanaugh would recuse himself because he ruled on the issue below? Do we have uh, the five votes up there to to reverse uh, the DC Circuit case? Anybody? I mean, you know, one answer to that might be maybe, I mean, may, who knows, maybe the court, I mean, I've heard some scholars speculate maybe the court won't take the case uh, as a result. Maybe the court will wait for some others to come up. Possibly this Collins decision from the Fifth Circuit might be a way to get at the idea of tenure protections for single directors. I mean, to me, it seems like because in Free Enterprise Fund, the court already demonstrated willingness to cut back some for cause removal protections that... Um, my sense is that the court's minimalist approach would be to um, strike the removal protections for the single director rather than doing something more dramatic like making it a multi-member commission because it seems to me at least that sort of requires a lot more rewriting of the statute than just severing one portion of it. But, um, but who knows, my suspicion is that we might see the court rule on this not, not in a CFPB case or not at least in a DC Circuit case but in something else within the next uh, couple of years. I will add one point, um, uh, and I agree with uh, um, Special Counsel Kerner. Uh, I, I don't see the constitutional difference on the separation of powers question between a multi-member independent commission and a single member. The, the theory that the multi-member uh, commission would check each other doesn't provide the constitutional check that's required. Um, it, it, it may create a greater opportunity for mischief in a single member, but it, I don't think it cures the constitutional problem. Um, so I'm, I'm agreeing with you, there's no difference, but where I'm disagreeing with you is I think they're all unconstitutional rather than all constitutional. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. Okay, next question. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Devin Watkins. Uh, as an originalist, I look closely at what James Madison said and some of the other founders, but James Madison advocated that the comptroller of the treasury have four cause protection. And so I wonder if we should instead be looking at what that for cause protection means. Should the president be able to remove a policy creating officer uh, for not creating policy that follows faithfully the law? Or as Myers said, an adjudicatory officer, a quasi-judicial officer, be removed after the adjudication for lack of wisdom or other reasons that Myers talks about. All right, anyone want to take that one on? <laughs> I think you've stumped him. <laughs> All right, well, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. So look, there's, this often comes up in the context of certain government functions are just too technical for the people to understand, and therefore uh, the constitutional system of people accountability, accountability to the people through their elected officials just doesn't work. We need to bring in the experts. And I think 100 years of experience with that progressive doctrine has proved that that doesn't work very well. In fact, oftentimes catastrophically much worse. I mean, we after, after all had experts at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that um, uh, gave us the greatest uh, recession since 1929. Um, you know, so, so I, I, I guess I would challenge the very um, basic assumption that if we get unaccountable experts in these technical fields, we'll all be better off. I just don't think that, that has born, experience has borne that out. All right, yes, sir. Hi, um, I'm Mike Doherty. I'm the CEO of LabMD and a business owner. <laughs> and I'm, I, I just won in the 11th Circuit, and I just want to, this is about accountability and specificity of accountability to the panel, and especially Professor Busby. I just read four sentences from this. So the court had said, doesn't that underscore the importance or significance of rulemaking? Otherwise, you're regulating data security on a case-by-case basis. And the FTC said, we are regulating data security on a case-by-case basis. And that's exactly what the Supreme Court says in Bell Atlantic and Chenery. And then the court says, and it doesn't matter whether the subject has any notice at all. And the FTC says, correct, correct. He says, okay, notice becomes irrelevant. And the FTC says, you can adopt new rules in an adjudication. The Supreme Court's made that very clear. And the court says, this is Judge Joe Platt, I appreciate your concessions. Now, we won. The company's dead. 700,000 cancer patients have to shift medical. There's carnage everywhere, which never comes up in the legal system. How do you hold these people accountable for gun to the head regulatory when they're off the chain and they have qualified immunity? How would you, in specificity, hold agencies off the chain accountable? I think that was to you, Professor. <laughs> I'm not, uh, yeah, honestly, I have not, I have not seen the case. I mean, if it, 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 part of what you were reading is part of longstanding it's oral argument from con, yeah, yeah. constitutional doctrine, which is going back to uh, the Chainery case, which is agencies have procedural choice how to make, not all to make rules, but how to make policy, and they can act through notice and comment rulemaking. They can develop policy on a case by case basis, uh, and this well, discretion. Well, they were just rejected flat out in that case. Um, and then, but this, in this whole body of law, which is longstanding, and actually one of the areas of law that the, the most conservative wing has most ardently adhered to over the decades, the idea is that courts should not be second, check, second guessing agencies' choices of how to proceed. Um, so I think what you're suggesting is you think there should be more done by notice and comment rulemaking, I would guess. I, again, well, I, I think knowing laws is a really nifty right. concept. <laughs> I'm saying is I, I think so. I, I think that you, you should know that there has been a long-standing view that more should be done by notice and comment rulemaking. That is, more knowable law is is better than law that can be wielded and announced for the first time in adjudications. And so I think in, if that's what you're getting at, and again, no, I no. What not I'm getting studied. at is that there's no accountability when we have a, 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 an agency parachuting in saying this is what you have to do for cybersecurity and it's gotten worse for 20 years and there's no accountability that they've completely screwed it up I, I, again, without I saying what the law is, which is the fundamental thing. They're not saying what you're supposed to do, which is what you earlier said your clients want to know. Right. So again, how do you hold them accountable if you're for agencies being held accountable? Um, there's mass destruction. I guess, just here. what is the name of the case? I'm just going to oh, look forward to reading. Lab MD. It's um, Lab, yeah, Lab FTC MD. versus Lab MD, and it yeah. seven, 11 Circuit. And then uh, they did not seek cert. Okay. okay. Look forward All to right. reading it. Thank Thanks. you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thanks. Next. 
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Stephen Casey from the uh, Austin, Austin area. Um, this question would be for Professor Eastman and Professor Busby. Um, and this sort of steps forward from the, <clears throat> the point the previous, uh, previous person brought up. I've been on, uh, done criminal defense before and also did some mortgage defense. So with civil and criminal issues. The question is, you know, laws are out there, people can go in the books and look at them, but with respect to notice, I represented people, plenty of mortgage, mortgage uh, owners for a house at foreclosure that had no idea of the protections that were in Regulation Z. There's just no, there's no ability for them to know where they were protected. On the other hand, because when someone buys a house, they've got to sign tons of disclosures, you see them just flying through there. There's a huge body of them that they're not made aware of. On the flip side of that, on the criminal side, you want to be able to adjust your behavior so you run afoul of the laws. We, we are running out of time, so I yeah, need so, you to connect this up to so the that, So how, do, how does someone know on the civil side or the criminal side, on the criminal side, how to protect themselves from violating one of these massive 10,000 sets of regulations? And on the civil side, what substantive rights have been created when it's just experts in a notice and comment period? Okay, I guess it's a question about inscrutability of the modern regulatory state I mean, and I, I, what do consumers I, do about that? I think that? Senator Lee offered a very good answer to that in, a, in the opening remarks of this convention, that we have allowed so much accretion of power over so many areas that are not constitutionally enumerated to the federal government that we've destroyed the subsidiary principles that where a lot of this stuff ought to have been resolved at much more local or state level where, where you do have a greater capacity to kind of keep track of what's going on. I'm, so it's a much bigger problem than just administrative agencies or deference or what have you. I mean, I guess I'd just say is that, you know, the complexity of law is a problem. It does mean we need lots of lawyers. That's not also necessarily a bad thing. But, the, uh, but I think the reality is that most people and businesses are more concerned with broad stroke law, that is law that is vague, and really are hoping there will be more specific instructions. The downside there is it does begin to accrete and can be hard to sort out. And so I do think that finding ways to make sure people know about their key legal rights and their obligations is essential. And I think that's some place where maybe the web can, will in time help us on that front. But that is a critical need for law to work. All right, last one. Go ahead, uh, sir. I'm, I'm Jimmy Conda. I'm a lawyer here in DC. And I think my question is really for John Eastman and Jennifer Mascot. Uh, and the question is, is the Federal Reserve's Federal Open Market Committee constitutional? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I, my, my intuition is to say no, but I don't know enough about the intricacies of that particular authorizing statute to be able to answer definitively. Sorry to duck it. You I'm going to pass it to Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, will, I will just say on a closing note, you know, Bill, Bill recommended this, this book by Jerry Mashaw, which does give a lot of rich history of the first administrative law in the first uh, few years. And I would uh, commend, we're heading up to winter break, I think pairing that book with Joe Postel's recent Bureaucracy in America, which goes over the same history and from a slightly different constitutional view, would be excellent reading for those of you who are interested enough in these issues to come to the panel. And... Uh, that's my last word. That's a great way to close with a reading list. Let's thank the panel.